So you have critics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would love you to take it seriously and sort of consider this criticism and try to steal man their their case. Uh, there's a bunch. Uh, I, I could mention uh, this this list of criticisms from Bob Ward in London School of mm -hmm. Economics. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but just on this point, in terms of one of the big costs being an energy, he criticizes your recent book in saying you consider the 143 billion in annual support for renewable energy, but ignore the 300 billion in fossil fuel subsidies. So a lot of the criticism has to do with, while well, you're cherry picking the models, which the models are always cherry picking anyway. anyway. So, uh, but you know you wanna take those seriously. So uh, he claims that you ignore, you're not hmm. uh, fully modeling the costs, the, the trade off here, how expensive is the renewable energy and how expensive is the fossil fuel? Can you steal Manus case? Sure. So uh, two things. Uh, uh, the first, the, the quote, is, it's absolutely true that the world spends a large uh, a chunk of money on fossil fuels, and that's just stupid, and we should stop doing it. We should also recognize that this is not rich countries. This is not the countries where we're talking about climate change. This is poor countries. This is Saudi Arabia. Uh, no, that's actually not a terribly poor country. Uh, it's China. It's Indonesia. It's uh, uh, Russia. Uh, it's places where you're basically paying off your population, just like that you subsidize bread. You make sure that they don't rebel by making cheap uh, uh, fuels available. That's dumb. But it's not like they, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They're mostly doing this for things that have nothing to do with climate. So I totally agree we should get rid of it. It's hard to do. Indonesia's actually somewhat uh, managed to uh, to get rid of it. Because remember, if you spend a lot of money on fossil fuel subsidies, you're basically subsidizing the rich. Because, you know, poor people don't have a car. It's the rich people who can now buy, you know, a very cheap gasoline. That's, you know, that's unjust as well. Uh, so it's dumb in so many different ways. I would never argue that you shouldn't do it. I've, I've plenty of times said we should stop that. But we should also recognize these are mostly regimes that are not going to be taken over either by my argument or Bob Ward's or <laughs> anyone else's. They're doing this for totally different reasons. Now, on the model side, there is virtually no model that don't show, uh, economic model, that don't show this has a cost. And that's the fundamental point is that the, you know, uh, uh, this is sort of a basic point from, from economics. The system is already working most effectively because if it wasn't, you know, you could actually make money changing over. So if you want to have a change outside of what the system is already doing, it's because you're saying you have to do something that you'd rather not want to do, namely use an energy source that is less convenient or less uh, uh, cost effective and so on. And that will incur a cost. Now there's huge discussion about just exactly how much cost is that. So there's definitely a cost. Is the cost going to be one or five trillion? That's absolutely a discussion about where do you take your models from? I try to do, and, and again, this is not possible everywhere. I try to actually take the average of all of the economic models. So there's a, a, there's a group called the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, which tries to pull together all these different groups that do the modeling. So some models, a lot of this cost actually comes down to uh, 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 the fact that we don't quite know how much more fossil fuels you're going to need in the future. And so if you're not going to, if your projections are, you're not going to use that much, the cost of reducing it is going to be very small. If you think you're going to use a ton of extra f fossil fuels and you have to reduce that, the cost is going to be bigger. So I think that's just one of the variables that's, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's right. many, many, many more. I think the, the point here is to say that if you take the average of all the best model is sort of aggregated, for instance, at the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, you're pretty secure ground. And and uh, so so again, I, I would argue that uh, Bob Ward, yes, I've had a lot of run-ins with Bob Ward, uh, uh, and, and he has a very different uh, set of views on, on things. Uh, but but I, I just don't think he's right in saying that I'm cherry picking. It, well, yes, and I mean, he also has similar criticism about the estimate of the EU cost of climate action uh, based on the NOP 2013 model. But ultimately these criticisms have to do is like, what are the sources for the different models? 
And, and just very briefly, I mean, I'm, I'm laying it out very transparently where I get these model, yes. uh, where I get these estimates from in, in the book. I've really tried to document this. And yes, I mean, look, there's nobody who sort of has all the information and gets everything right in all of these areas. Uh, I, I, I think most of uh, uh, Bob Ward's uh, argument is is not a uh, uh, a good faith effort to uh to sort of uh improve on on these estimates he's he's right in saying some of these estimates we only have a few estimates and you know yeah i'd like to have more of them i one thing i should mention is that there is very little interest in general and there's very little funding in finding out how much do our climate policies cost because that's you know that's just inconvenient to everyone yeah in in the whole game you know who wants to know that that you know for instance uh, uh, uh would would you want to fund uh something that says that the inflation reduction act is not going to be very effective of course you don't want to do that right so so it's it, again it's a little bit the you know flock of birds will look some at something else and and what i think is that given that we're paying for it at the end this is you know this is public money we're deciding we're going to spend money here rather than there let's at least you know, look at what are the best estimates out there. I would love to be have more estimates. Uh, more estimates is always better. And I, just a quick comment on the good faith part. Me as a consumer looking for truth, it's hard to find who's good faith and not. So it's not only are you looking for a sort of accurate information, you're also trying to infer about the communicator of that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very difficult. It's, it's um. And you know, you put me on the on the podcast. Of course, I'm going to say I'm a trustworthy <laughs> guy. Well, but, but yeah, I, 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 mean, I mean, but I, and you, we you, believe we're yeah. trustworthy too. But um, you know, I've been reading for various reasons, but mostly because I've been traveling to Ukraine and thinking and just about the people's um, suffering through war. I've been reading a lot about World War II and and Stalin and Hitler, and you know, from the perspective of Hitler. Uh, he really believed he's doing good for the world and he was communicating from his perspective in good faith. Um, he started to believe, I think early on his own propaganda. So you, your, even your understanding and perception of the world completely shifted. So it's, it's very, very, very difficult mm. to understand who to trust. Um, and uh, just because it's a consensus in a particular community, doesn't necessarily mean it's a source of trust. So it's a, I, I mean, mm. basically, I don't know how to operate in this world, except to have a humility and constantly question, question your assumptions. And, uh, but not so much that you're completely out in the ocean, not knowing yeah. what is true and not. So it's this weird, weird world, because I, I ultimately, bigger than climate, my hope is to have institutions that can be trusted. And that's been very much under attack um, in as as part of the climate debate, as, as part of the COVID debate, as part of all of these discussions. And science, to me, is one of the sources of truth. And the fact that that's under question now is uh, something that hurts me uh, on many levels uh, deeply. You said something earlier that I took a note down, down here, and I can't find it, about cooperation. It was like collaborative cooperation or something like that? Sure. What, to me, uh, there was a point like in 2013, after just dealing with all everything you've been grappling with, what if you don't if you know you don't know how this is going to work out, what do you work on? And I, one morning I made a list of words that kind of summarized basically system properties that give you confidence in a system, trust or in their transparency is one, just as you were saying earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, connectivity is another, you, you know, so that everyone's connected. So on the subsidy issue, for example, there are young entrepreneurs in Nairobi who are selling ingeniously using Nairobi's digital currency, uh, propane, the fuel that's in our backyard barbecue grills, which comes out of gas wells, but it's a separate fuel, uh, in little increments that poor people can use instead of charcoal. And LPG subsidies are, are helping them get people off of charcoal, which is a horrific Terrible. trade mm -hmm. from the source through the warlords in Somalia and elsewhere who are getting the money to the pollution in houses. 
So, so having be sure being sure when we're having these big debates about who the World Bank is going to give loans to, and, and drawing a simple line: no more fossil fuel subsidies hurts a really good, valuable, small scale but scalable way to have people not die from cooking smoke in their houses and and take down forests. So, so, but that only is considered if they're in the conversation. So connectivity, full connectivity, digital access. So, so, so those entrepreneurs are, are in the mix of people. When they're thinking about subsidies, you're not just thinking about Big Bad Exxon. You're thinking about this little company in Nairobi, Pago, Pago LPG, I think is the name. In India, the same thing. So, so, so you can list those properties of systems. And the IPCC wasn't originally transparent when I started writing about it in 1988, 1990. And now it's way more transparent. They have more public review. So it's even better than it was. It's like a really good example of a science process of assessing the science, providing periodic output to the world, and iteratively improving the model going forward because of critique, because of, because of um, you know scrutiny, um, and finding better ways for that to interface with people so they have information they can use from that big thing. And the media, you know, are not doing a good job um, because of this front page thoughtism. Um, but we can all, you know, I work partially in academia, Columbia, on an initi initiative partially in communication innovation. Like how can we have an open landscape of access to information that matters? How can you, what can you do to foster better conversations so that words like collapse aren't just thrown around like emblems? And, and so it's system properties give you confidence, I think. Uh, and then you, then you don't have to like be flailing around for Bjorn or Tom Tom Friedman or um, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, you can always right now find your 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 character to follow. But I think what would be better is if you actually develop some skills to just have a basic ability to know how to cut to the chase. Can I can I just follow up on that because one of the things that I try to do and and so my day job is actually something else. I work with a think thing called the Copenhagen Consensus. Uh, where we work with uh, more than 300 of the world's top economists, and we work with seven Nobel laureates in economics. And and the the point there is really to talk about where can you spend a dollar and do the most good for the world. That's that's basically the the thing that we try to do. And and as as you rightly point out, look, there are lots of different estimates of what can you do, for instance, on climate. What can you do on tuberculosis? What can you do for uh, vulnerability in all kinds of different different ways? And and if these were all sort of well, you can spend a dollar here and do two point three six, but you can spend a dollar here and do two point three four over here. I would worry a lot, but that's not how the world works because we're terribly inefficient. So there are literally lots and lots of amazing things you can do out there. There's a lot of low hanging and, fruit. And there's a lot of not terribly great things that you can do. And unfortunately, one of the things that I try to sort of battle is that, you know, we get a lot of things right. That's why, you know, the world is a lot better than what it used to be. Uh, but the things that are sort of left, left over are often you know, the boring things that happen to be incredibly effective and the exciting things that are often not that terribly effective. Uh, and, and so I think one way to look at this is basically to have people do cost benefit across a wide range of areas. And we try to get a lot of different economists to do this and they come up with different numbers and different models and different results. But if you sort of consistently get that some things give you, you know, in tens or maybe even hundreds of dollars back per dollar, Remember, this is not actually you getting rich, it's the world getting rich. It's that the world gets better worth a hundred dollars for for every dollar you spend. And over here you can spend a dollar and do somewhere between 30 cents and maybe a couple of dollars. You should probably be focused on the other opportunity first. And that's really the point that I try to make with climate. There are some smart things we can do, and I hope we get to talk about them uh in, in climate. But there's also a lot of sort of the standard approaches to fixing climate turns out to be very likely below one dollars back in a dollar and certainly not terribly high you know even if you're very optimistic it'll be like two or three whereas many other things are just fantastically better investment like the thing i've been advocating uh, a modest proposal to eat the children of the, of the poor in england was that the <laughs> in uh, jonathan swift modest proposal from yeah. a few centuries ago um so it's not just 
cost benefit, it's also in the context of what is moral and not and all that. Well, the full the full complexity. Of it. But that you just hit on something really important. You know, having been on this beat for so long, and again on the disaster beat as well, earthquakes. I can't tell you how many disaster science experts keep telling me, like everyone says, preparedness, invest for preparedness. A strict cost benefit analysis will always tell you a dollar invested in resilience before a community gets hit by whatever is worth 10, you'll always have to spend 10 after. And so it's fine to do the cost benefit stuff, but it's just the baseline. Then you have to look at the social science, which shows, or history, which shows you how few times we do it. It's like, we just don't do it. Therefore, you can bang that drum. I, your work is valuable, but it's really constrained because show me in the world where that does happen and then how you turn that success, which is basically something not happening, hmm. into so, a story. So, just, just very briefly, you know, we, we try to, so we, we do this for a lot of countries. So we yeah. did it for uh, yeah. Haiti, for instance, uh, uh, funded by the Canadian Development uh, Ministry because they're basically saying we spent a billion dollars in Haiti since the earthquake and we really can't tell the difference. Right. So they wanted to find, they, I mean, they actually say that, right? And so they said, we want to find out what are the really smart things you can do in Haiti. And so we, we uh, together with lots of you know uh, uh, people in Haiti and all the you know the business community and the political community and the religious community and labor community and everybody else, what are the smart things to do? And then we had economists evaluate it, and there are a yeah. lot of these things that everybody wanted that were not all that smart. There's actually a lot of smart things, and yes, the politicians didn't pick most of them. So our our sense is, we try to give people uh, you know you're thinking about these seventy things. You should actually just think about these 20 things. Right. And then we consider ourselves incredibly lucky if they actually do one of them.